Hello, and welcome to another episode of our Outlier Founders series, where we dig into the ideas, frameworks, and strategies of the world's best startup founders. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, I'm joined by Mo Islam, co-founder of Payload Space, which is building a media empire dedicated to covering the business and policy of space, as in outer space. I discovered Payload and immediately subscribed to their daily newsletter after it was recommended by Delian Asparhoof, co-founder of Varda Space Industries in episode 71. I asked Delian what newsletters and websites he used to stay on top of everything going on in space, and he had only one answer, Payload Space. So I'm thrilled to have Mo Islam of Payload Space on the show for a deep dive into the business and geopolitics of space. In this episode, we go deep on why we're at an inflection point when it comes to space and how that was unlocked, at least in the U.S., largely by SpaceX, which has brought down the price to get a unit of mass up to low Earth orbit by an order of magnitude. The outsized role the military and defense departments play as customers for space companies ranging from Earth imaging to satellite manufacturing startups and the space companies that Mo thinks are the most underrated, as well as how Payload is building a media empire, starting with what Mo calls the modern homepage, which is their daily newsletter, plus how they crafted a compelling voice and editorial style in an old school and relatively stodgy industry, making space cool to read and learn about. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 110. That's episode 110. And you can learn more about Payload and subscribe to their newsletter, which I highly recommend, at payloadspace.com. With that, here's my conversation with Payload's Mo Islam. Mo, I am so excited to finally have you on. This interview has been a long time coming. So thank you so much for making time and welcome to Outlier Academy. Daniel, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and very excited about our conversation. It's it's let's there's a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and kick off. I I normally don't do this, but I want to share some quick background on this interview. Um so th- we've been working on this for quite a while, but the origin for this is, you know, Quite a few months ago now, I had Delian of Varda Space Holdings on. Love Delian. It was a fantastic interview. One of my favorite questions was asking him, because I'm relatively new to space, what he uses to stay on top of the space industry. And he literally had one answer, and it was <laughs> Payload Space. Uh, and it was, you know, his favorite newsletter. And, you know, as I dug into it more, it made sense. You guys cover, you guys have a very interesting angle in that you cover the business and politics of space, not just kind of general purpose. And then I've subscribed to the newsletter and it's become one of my favorite all-time reads. So I first just want to say thank you and then we'll get in and explore this. But, you know, it's a fascinating, I don't know, way to introduce a guest to Outlier Academy. <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying that. Um, and and thank you for, for supporting us and thank you for reading us. And Dalian has been a uh, early supporter of us and we're very appreciative of him. And, you know, I was, I was actually just on a panel with him at Miami Tech Week. That's right. Uh, so That's he's, right. he's, he's a good friend and he's, he's been great. But I love when I hear that folks are, are, uh, are marketing uh, the, the the business. So always love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. I want to start uh, by having you talk about what you're building and how it's different. And obviously, I talked a second ago, you guys focus on business and politics. And we'll spend a good bit of this episode on the politics side, which I think will be very interesting and different. Um, how do you describe what you're building to others? How did you land on this approach for Payload? Yeah, and I, the only addendum I would add is it's um, we would say policy of space rather than politics of space. It's a minor difference, but I do think it it it, it gives off a different uh, different vibe yes. <laughs> depending which one, on which one you use. But uh, but in its simplest form, Payload is a digital media company, and again, we cover the business and policy of the space industry. Um, I co-founded the the business about now over a little over a year and a half ago, closing in on two years with my good friend Ari Lewis. Uh, really for two reasons. I think the first was to bridge a gap that we felt that was present in the industry um, with regards to media coverage. And then it was also to bring a fresh new perspective and culture to a very, very traditional industry, right? Aerospace and defense has been around for a very, very long time, since the 50s, pretty much, um, and even earlier than that. Um, but, you know, we've, we, we're trying to instill a completely new brand identity and culture with what's happening and sort of the, and alongside the commercial space movement. So our first product was a uh, weekly news, newsletter. I originally handled the writing. Um, Ari was really focused on audience development and growth. And, you know, the initial traction was just a lot better than we expected. 
which uh, is, 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 is miraculous considering my writing ability. So I don't know how we got through that initial phase, but um, we had a lot of industry professionals that reached out to us basically saying like how refreshing um, our takes were and, and, and style was. And I think the sort of seminal moment for us was like when we had a number of public company CEOs that signed up, um, which was for us to signal that, you know, hey, you know, we need to go out and properly build this. So over the past summer, we actually ended up raising a small seed round from a number of just awesome investors, um, which allowed us to go and like start hiring um, an all-star team. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I want to switch and talk about your background now um, because all this is interweaved. You know, I, I often think it's um, one of the lenses that I use to think about companies is thinking about the founders. And one of the questions I ask is, are these people, is this person one of the top 5, 10, 15 people in the world to build this business? And I think in this case, you are, especially for the way that you cover payload. So give a quick sketch of your background and talk a little bit about when you first became interested in space and then how that interest evolved over time. Yeah, so I'll start with the first question. Um, I have been interested in space as long as I can remember, literally as long as I can remember. Um, I've always been obsessed, um, always wanted to be an astronaut. I know that's every little kid's dream to be an astronaut. For me, it just really just literally never went away. And uh, I think that, you know, I, I did when I went into school, I was thinking like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, pursue some type of aerospace engineering job and, and work for NASA. And that was always part of the plan. But uh, somewhere along the line, um, I decided to become an investment banker instead. <laughs> I had a I had a college roommate who uh, basically sold me sort of the vision and the glamour. And I'm from New York originally, so I didn't really understand it at first. But it, it ended up started to, it, it it became a, a lot more interesting to me. And, and you know, I effectively said, okay, well, you know what, I'm going to give this banking thing a shot. And then within basically the first year, I was like, this was a terrible mistake. <laughs> then the rest of my time, I was just really thinking, like, how do I get back to the industry that I was so passionate about. And, you know, I realized that maybe there's ways that I can help on the financing side. And there was so much going on um, in the early days, even so like, um, but really SpaceX was, was one of the big sort of um, key catalysts for the industry. And I was able to work on that deal um, when, when I was at JP Morgan. And that really helped solidify in my mind that I was like, okay, you know what, my place in this industry you know, is through capital. Like if I can provide capital, if I can help other investors understand and learn what's happening in the industry, then like that's my, that can be my contribution to the industry. And I can, that's how I can build my network. So that's really what I did for the bulk of my career. And I think it certainly has helped a lot in shaping the sort of investment lens of payload. But I, I have to say, right, payload is definitely a team effort, right? And from the early days, the fact that Ari and I had had such different backgrounds really helped our ability to execute. Like Ari really is the media guy, right? He had a, he's a media and he has a policy background. Um, he, he's, you know, he's consulted for media businesses. And he also started one of the largest tech associati associations in Ohio. And, you know, my career raising and investing in private technology businesses, I think that just kind of gives us like a bit of a dual lens when it comes to what's happening in space. That's sort of like, I think, helped us really get off the ground. But really, I think the catalyst that's really helped us grow in the way we had, in the way we did was really um, hiring Ryan Duffy from uh, Morning Brew. He was our founding editor. And he was really at the, at the brew. He was responsible for building the um, emerging tech vertical, and he, you know, ended up helping it grow, grow to a few hundred thousand subscribers. So it was very obvious to us when we originally were thinking about, okay, what do we want payload to be? Like, you know, I hate to use analogies to describe our business, but like, you know, the morning brew of space. And he said, what, who, who better to help build us, build the morning brew of space than someone who was so instrumental at morning brew, right? So, um, so Ryan was an excellent first hire. Rachel Zisk, um, who previously worked on the FT and, and Popular Science as a science writer, was our second hire. And, mo and we most recently brought in um, Jess Liss, who has worked on both the policy side and the media side, working at Insider Intelligence. But really, I think the one key thing you'll notice between all of those people is we don't, neither one of us have actual space backgrounds. That was very, very deliberate. We specifically said, if we're trying to change the culture of space and like the way space is covered and the media side of space, like we need to really take a take a very ground up approach from bottoms up approach. And it, to be quite honest, in the beginning, we just didn't know if we were going to make the right decision or if that was the right decision. And looking back on it, it was absolutely the right decision, right? So we just hired smart people who understood science, who understood business, um, and who had a passion for the industry, most importantly. And you know, we've been able to just 
have a completely different lens on what's happening. And I think that's really helped us grow as quickly as we have. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that also really helps match the approach or the perspective that your readers have. Yes, it sounds like you have some insiders that are obviously subscribing. But by and large, I think it's people who are fascinated by space, want to stay on top of it, but they're not people that are working day in and day out in the industry. And so I think that outsider you know, lens is really helpful. I want to talk a little bit about space first, and then we'll come back to what you're building at Payload. Um, and I've got a lot of questions there. But you know, the way I wanted to kind of kick off the the space portion of this interview was to talk about the fact that we're at an inflection point. You know, you use that to talk about Payload, and for anyone I think that's following the industry, you can kind of feel it. You know, even just uh, what, something that happened recently, what Rocket Lab did their version of basically catching a booster that was coming down, where they caught it via helicopter. You know, totally crazy different approach, a a first for them, a first for the industry being able to catch that. And so we're still in this moment where you're seeing these firsts continue to play out um, and there's a lot going on. So, you know, maybe start from there. How would you frame up the inflection point that we're at and and what does that feel like? uh, You know, how do you how do you see that uh, day to day? Yeah, so I would say that. The inflection point um, that I'm really referring to um, is it, it's really it can be dialed down to two key reasons, right? And I think the first is more on the investor side, on the financing side, the investor appetite to actually fund commercial space initiatives. Um, and I think the second piece, and I'll and I'll get into the first piece in just a second, but the second piece is really this like Elon Musk inspired sort of iterative nature of company building, right? That's been very prominent in Silicon Valley, but now is is actually something that's being um, addressed and and sort of taken in as an, as an ethos within commercial space, right? That's never happened before. So if you take a look, for example, on the financing side, there has been an incredible, incredible, incredible amount of capital flow in the industry recently. I think last year, the number was something like 8 billion was invested in startup uh, space companies, which broke the previous record by about, uh, about a billion, right? So it's like 7 billion, now it's 8 billion. And there's no, I will say though, it's end of May right now, right? We're, we're chatting and, and the market is in complete disarray. There's a lot of uh, macro issues that we're seeing across the board. Um, space is a bit insulated, um, and we can talk about that later. But like um, space for geopolitical reasons is, is insulated from a lot of it. But there's no doubt that this sort of near-term slowdown um, will also affect space. I think in the near term, there's going to be some, especially with like the SPAC sort of implosion. Um, there's going to be some folks who say, okay, like let's actually just take a step back and see what we are investing in, and sort of the R and D cycles and how long this, these companies are going to take to actually be to be um, positive on on the profitability side. So, as investors like recalibrate, I think that's going to create a little bit of slowdown. But we've definitely opened up Pandora's box, right? In a way that it really comes down to how invest like how investors perceive hardware based industries. Like when you look back at the um, global financial crisis and you think about the companies that were actually formed during that time. Like Slack, Uber, Airbnb, Square, Instagram, WhatsApp, right? They all started in the midst of the crisis. So it's really interesting to think that, and these are all companies that have really shaped the modern era of mobile compute and enterprise and consumer technology. And I think if you really look back, if you really look forward, excuse me, for the next 10 years, I think that what you're going to see is that those generational defining companies are going to be within space and they're going to be within climate tech and they're going to be within biotech. And I think perception of how software can be applied to hardware and how that can unlock efficiencies and value that we've never seen before. Like that's what's exciting about sort of this next 10, 20 years, like a true like impact era of everything that we've done to get us to here and where it's going to take us. I think, that I, I, I just think we've opened up Pandora's box and it's going to be really exciting to see. So, you know, that's really kind of point one of the inflection point. The really, the second point really is just around Musk. He has a very love hate and like, you know, relationship with a lot of people. And I think especially with his recent comments and Twitter and all this stuff, right? He's on the news, he's in the news for a lot of different reasons. But um, the reality is what he's done for the industry is he's changed how risk is assessed. He just completely changed the way that companies approach risk. Um, it, you know, SpaceX, of course, takes a very Silicon Valley approach of, you know, let's build rockets, let's blow them up publicly, let's iterate. That's gonna, that's okay, right? That's never been okay. NASA has never done that, right? They spend billions of dollars of developing and testing, developing and testing before they even launch, right? Now, SpaceX and Musk has turned that upside down. They've created this feedback loop for the industry that's never existed before. And, you know, I think that that's going to create like a lot of opportunity and like, you know, it's changed the way investors look at risk. It's changed the way companies look at risk. And, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot 
more to say about that. That to me is sort of what's what what's led us to this inflection point. Yeah. I'd love to try to talk about, I guess, a couple of pieces of that. And one is, I want to come back to the Musk point, but I first want to talk about the business of space because something you've alluded to a little bit that I want to dive into deeper is the fact that space has a couple of different customers. You know, one of those is industry. You know, you can think of something like Verta Space Holdings and the fact that Delian brought up that Merck has been spending, I don't even know, it's... 10 million, 100 million, something like that uh, on the space station, on the International Space Station to do drug development for quite a while. And they had a breakthrough with Keytruda. You know, that could potentially happen on a bigger scale with stuff like Varda and some of the other companies that are being built. Um, But the other side of the business is defense. And it's very, very, very different. Talk about that side of the business and talk about how that shapes how space companies uh, think about revenue, how it shapes just the business equation of what it means to succeed as a space company. (laughs) <laughs> there's sort of a reason why the industry is called aerospace and defense, right? I think um, they've always gone hand in hand. And if we really even go back to the 50s, um, you know, the father of rocketry, right? Werner von Braun was part of the Nazi party. He built Didn't the V2 that. rockets. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm not going to go into the politics of who he was, but he was part of the party and he built the V2 rocket that were used against all of Europe, very famously in London, right? So like this was the guy who built the Apollo era um, Saturn V rocket. And, you know, effectively what happened is at the end of the war, the US and the Soviets all kind of descended upon Germany and said, we need to make sure that we hire like these smart, these super smart people and basically give them two choices. Either you're going to prison or you're going to come work for us, right? And we're going to give you citizenship. And we're... Anyway, so it's a, it's a, there's a lot to say about that topic. But eventually, right, he was brought to the States and he helped accelerate our space capabilities. And at the end of the day, when you really think about rockets, they're bombs. And we've used them to now explore sort of the great beyond and not just use them to kill people. But I mean, if you really think about it, right, like everything has this like dual use, like rockets are obviously dual use for clear reasons. GPS, right, was originally a fringe navigational tool in the 80s that was used by the military. Satellite imaging, right, can be used to track troop movements. Um, and, and, you know, the government has always been and will for the foreseeable future um, be the biggest buyer of, of space services, right, and aerospace and defense services. And that's going to continue to drive and shape innovation in, 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 in the space. So I think that in my mind, I mean, the government effectively helped build this industry, right? It has its roots in military. And I think going forward, it's going to, you know, I mean, when you think about like even imaging data, right? Imaging data can be used to track troop movements, but it can also be used to tra- 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 um, to monitor greenhouse gas emissions, right? GPS can be used to, to, to guide military planes. It can also be, you know, help you find the quickest way to Chipotle, right? So space, tech's, space tech has dramatically changed our way of life. And I think one of the biggest issues of like the industry is that a lot of civilians don't understand the power of space tech. And that's one of the things that we are trying to solve, like helping helping folks understand like, OK, like this industry is actually phenomenally important to what we do every yes. day. Yes. I mean, yeah, I think one small lens that I've seen that through is is satellite imagery. You know, one from it being used by newspapers like the New York Times to do reporting about Xinjiang and, you know, or the Ukraine war to even just, you know, small little footnotes like one of the pieces of military assistance we're getting we're giving Ukraine is basically opening up and giving them satellite imagery access, you know, and also satellite imagery is heavily regulated in terms of what you can see and what you can't see by the government. <laughs> and I would assume that they probably get the best of the best in terms of what's there. So it's just fascinating to see even just that one massive, massive, like for good general purpose use cases, but also very targeted and tailored military use cases that you just talked about. No, it's good. And, and look, I mean, you bring, bring up earth imaging, right? Earth imaging is illuminating the true atrocities and the impact of the war, right? Companies like Planet and Max are whose images have been circulated, you know, and shared globally millions of times, right? If this, if this happened a decade ago, then, you know, NRO would have spy satellites kind of imaging areas of conflict, but we would never be able to see it as civilians, right? And we'd basically be taking the government's word for what was happening. But there's now, I think there's this starting to see, you're starting to see some realization sort of among citizens that space can actually create this enormous amount of transparency. And it's really just getting started, right? Resolutions are improving. There are commercial companies pushing the sort of boundaries of now, not just kind of sort of imaging capabilities, but the insights that you can actually glean from that data. And I don't know if you saw, but um, the NRO just came out this morning and gave Maxar Plan and Black Sky billions of dollars worth of revenue, right, via their 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 sort of new kind of imaging contracts. So like the government has basically signaled that they want to become more of a buyer of this data and they want to use the commercial industry. 
Yeah. Well, I think that leads in really nicely to the next piece, which is to talk about geopolitics. Because then obviously I assume, you know, even just with this example, like Earth Imaging, clearly the government is investing in the best of the breed, you know, companies that are grown locally. And I'm sure every country that's vying for military power and might is doing the same thing with their own local industry. How do you think about or how do you frame up for people the geopolitics of space? Here's how I would say very simply, right? Very simply, we are in the next space race. We are living in the next space race, right? Um, and it's going to have huge implications for the way we build technology, the way we spend dollars in, in military. And I think that, you know, all of the countries and all the players are really just getting started, right? So if you actually, if you actually look back in the Apollo era, right, when we went to the moon, yes, it was to help progress humanity and advance our technology and be this like amazing, you know, country that could show the world what we could do. But really behind that all, was we wanted to beat the Soviet Union. When Sputnik went into space, like that was into orbit, like that was a generational defining, you know, there was a defining moment for a lot of people that, you know, at the time, like no one really knew what that meant. Everyone was very, very scared, right? So our desire to get to the moon was really built around showcasing to the world that actually democracy is sort of what can help you win as a society. Now, we are sort of facing that same issue again, right? And I want to tread very carefully about what I say on this po- on these points. But, you know, right now, we are certainly in another um, space race with the Eastern world. China has, uh, on the military side, you know, they've, China and Russia have both done anti-satellite tests, missile tests that have, you know, led to enormous amount of debris. Um, you know, they're jamming um, broadband satellites and communication satellites. Uh, they have plans to go to the moon and, and Mars. And we're going to be faced with that same dilemma where, we have to ask ourselves if um, those countries can make it, those sort of totalitarian countries can make it there before we do, who are we to say that democracy actually works and helps create progress and innovation, right? So that's why it's super important. Now, setting aside the geopolitical side of things, right, there's also the fact that just in general, like military space budgets have gone up, right? 20, um, 2021 was a record year for the government when it came to space investment. It was something like 90, I think there's like $92 billion total. Like, I think this is, glo- this is a global number, right? And about 20% went to, um, went to defense. And then uh, Biden very recently requested $26 billion for the 2023 fiscal year NASA budget, which was the highest request ever for the agency, right? So um, in general, like military expenditures, yes, they're all going up. That's not surprising based on what's happening in, in, in Eastern Europe. But the, this whole space kind of capital and, and sort of government um, budgets towards space is, has been going up, you know, pretty consi- consistently for the next few years. And that's all, also why, right, if you actually look at the public markets, you know, the S&P is down something like, I don't know, 16, 17%. NASDAQ's down 25, 26%. But the aerospace and defense sector is down only a few percent. And if you actually look at like the Lockheed Martins and the Boeings of the world and Northrop Grumman's of the world, actually not Boeing, Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, they're up like 10, 15, 20 percent. Right. And it's just it's just that in itself just showcases what's happening. Yeah, it's really well said. Okay, I want to ask two more questions and then we'll shift and talk about, you know, the business and what you're building at Payload. The the first question that I want to ask is, you know, you alluded to this earlier. So obviously, did Planet Labs come via SPAC? I think Rocket Labs did. Yes. Okay. Rocket so, Lab did and Planet. Yes. So we've now seen multiple, what I would consider best in breed space companies come public via SPACs in, in 2021. Clearly, one of the things that we're seeing in public markets is, uh, and this has been a dramatic change from 2021 to 2022, is people now taking a very a much harsher look at businesses where they feel like real revenue or real profitability is a ways out. And one of the questions I've always kind of thought to myself for the space sector is how to think about it, because it just seems fundamentally very different. Number one, it is not capital inintensive. Of course, massive amounts of capital and massive amounts of investment, especially upfront. And then two, you know, I guess I sometimes struggle to come up with a great answer of how much bigger it, or how much more money is flowing into the industry, say, five years from now or 10 years from now than, than what we see today. So I won't ask you any of those questions. Those are, those are maybe a little too in the weeds. But I guess the question I would ask is, how do you think about a space business? And maybe you can give a specific example like Rocket Labs or Planet Labs you know, is it important that they have revenue and profitability today? How, you know, if you were there, how would you think about that? And and how do you, you know, maybe in conversations with CEOs, how do CEOs of private businesses that are going to be public think about profitability and revenue? 
just seems like an interesting moment in space. <laughs> Profitability, the age old, age old question. Um, so, 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 so I think the lesson learned from the SPAC um, situation is that there are a number of companies that went public by a SPAC that really shouldn't have. And I think that the, um, and, and that's really easy to say now, like sitting here and seeing what happened, right? But I think he, here's sort of the underlying issue, right? The, the, well, there's a lot of underlying issues, right? I think the first is when the projections were done for these companies, right? There was really no oversight on the regulatory side. So people could say whatever they wanted about where their revenue was going to be in two, three, four, five years, right? The issue is that public markets and you know, it's it's fairly efficient and it's really the great equalizer, meaning that if you say something is going to happen and that doesn't happen, you're going to get penalized for it, right? You're going to get penalized extremely hard for it. And that is exactly what's happening, right? So generally speaking, the public markets, it's not where you want to be doing R&D. You don't want to be doing R&D in public markets, right? Like that's just not what it's built for. Um, the only industry that I can think of where that's like sort of the norm is like biotech. But then again, like people view biotech sort of as binary options um, in most cases. Now, um, so, how, how, so, okay, so you're an investor, right? And let's take a step back. Like, so what do you do? I think if you're a public company and if you're looking at investing in a public space company, I think you need to look at two things. One, you need to look at like, you know, what is this company actually projecting in revenue? And is there a reasonable degree of probability that they're actually going to hit that? Like you have to, you have to do the market analysis and see, like, is that market demand there? Like if you're looking at an earth observation business and they're saying that, hey, we're going to do 500 million of revenue in next year. But then if you look at market reports and say, okay, well, the actual industry, and, and by the way, these numbers, I'm just totally making up. If the actual industry is, I don't know, 4 billion. Right. So the question becomes like, okay, can this company be 500 million of the $4 billion? And like, does that make sense? Like, okay, it doesn't. Okay. So they're probably not going to get there. Right. So if they keep missing those numbers, then the stock is going to get hit. Can they go and raise more money? Right. I think that's the other issue. Right. If you, in the public markets, in order to raise money, you need to do follow on offerings. And if your stock price plummets, right, that's not, that's really, not, that's really not a good situation. Right. So you also have to look at burn. Like how much money is this company burning, um, and are they going to actually be able to meet, you know, their targets? And are they going to have enough cash in a year or two before they need to raise more money? Um, and these are companies that I'm also assuming from day one aren't profitable, right? Um, and, and in most cases, a lot of the space companies that are public are not profitable. Now, taking aside the public space companies, what I would say if you're looking at the private side. Um, I think the question is a little bit, uh, I, I mean, you can sort of use the same lens in terms of like, you know, how much money does this company need to actually get to their end product? If they're still in R&D phase, if they're building some type of new launch mechanism, how much money do they need before they can actually send that, you know, start testing and send whatever they want to in space? And are they going to have customers? And do they have a pipeline lined up, right? Those are the questions I think you need to ask. But in general, you're starting to see more and more companies that are like, kind of like, what I would call second and third order products of the space economy that are going, that are doing, you know, X, they're building XYZ product or service, but it's dependent upon a first layer of the economy, like, you know, fuel depots in space, really, really interesting. But in order for, and I, and I know for, you know, I know that that will one day be a product that we need, but the question is in order for you to actually build that into a, you know, thriving like business, there needs to be a lot of things in space that actually need that product and service. So like how long will it take before, you know, there's actually going to be a demand for that product. And, you know, if it's going to take five years, six years, fine. So like how much money does this company need to raise or do they have enough money to get them to that point? Right. Those are the questions you have to ask. And you can never assume that the market is going to be there. Right. Meaning like the capital is going to be there, that they're going to be able to go out and raise money. That's one of the biggest problems that space companies have is that they run out of money. Right. That's not that's you know, that's not a um, novel concept, but it's something that I think you know, especially in this market, I think you just need to be particularly wary of any company that has a clear dual use when it comes to like government military. I think you have a really strong case because the government is the biggest buyer right now and will be for the foreseeable future. So if you have a way into government dollars, I think I would be, I'd feel a lot safer about that than a true commercial use case, which you need like a first layer or the second layer of the economy to actually develop before you actually have a real product that has real demand. Yep. Just on that question, you know, just going back to multiple times now, we've already discussed that the government is the biggest buyer, the biggest source of revenue, the biggest customer today. 
When do you think that might change? And who do you think that, you know, next customer would be? Is it effectively industrial use cases? Is it just space companies using each other's products, almost like an ecosystem? How do you think about that? Because I guess one thing I wonder is just, A, will that ever be true? <laughs> so I'd love your thoughts yeah. on that. Um, and then yeah. B, what would, what would that look like? in your mind? What could that look like? I think that the government will be a huge buyer for a very, very long time. That's just the reality. Um, I think that the commercial customer really just depends on what kind of vertical within space you're talking about. I mean, if you're talking about, for example, satellite imaging, right? There's a lot of use cases that you know, in this, the industry has been talking about everything from insurance to mining to, uh, you know, you know, agricultural tracking crop yields, you know, to, to monitoring, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. And obviously, there's a, you know, climate angle, of course, to all this, right. So I think those, uh, as the imaging data becomes cheaper and cheaper, and I think there's also an argument of whether it becomes commoditized or not. I know that's a that's a sort of back and forth in the industry. But, you know, um, I think it just, uh, so sorry, to answer your question, I think it just totally depends on what vertical, like, um, there are going to be certain industries where it's just going to be the industry, like, really, as the customer, right? If you think of, like, for example, like what Hadrian's doing in terms of verticalizing the aerospace and defense supply chain, right? Most of the folks that are going to be using that product are clearly industry, right? Versus, like, you know, earth observation or communication, um, or, you know, launch, right? So I think it just depends on, on the industry. But I think, Commercial is coming. There's no question because costs are coming down. Um, and, you know, the one kind of elephant in the room that people do talk about, but, you know, I don't think it's it's too widely used in discussion right now, especially with business models, is what Starship is going to do. You know, Starship has the ability, if um, and, and I'm very confident that Elon's going to pull it off, but Starship does have the ability to drop launch costs another order of magnitude. And that does dramatically change unit economics um, and business models for a lot of space companies. And it's going to be very exciting what that does to the industry. Very, very exciting. So um, I think that a lot of what we just said could be accelerated by maybe 2x um, if Starship works on time, right? So that's sort of the outlier, so to speak, that we don't, we just don't know what, you know, what the end result is going to be. I mean, we have an idea if it works, right? But I don't think a lot of people truly understand what the impact is going to be. Yeah. Well, and it's really interesting. Like hearing you say that, it's almost like what Starship could become is an entirely new input into the math equation of what businesses work and what businesses don't. Because today, if you're, if you're a founder, the math equation is based off current rockets, current you know current costs, current mass that you can get into space, all of these things. And yeah, if it changes in order of magnitude, that dramatically changes what works, what doesn't work, and even you know what's what's possible. So it's fascinating to think about that. I want to ask uh, kind of a final question, which is there's a lot of stuff going on in, in, in space. You know, we've talked about Earth observation. I was going to say recently, too, I saw a company deck that was basically marketing that they think a uh, future use case of Earth observation is when you have a wedding to basically get satellite images of your wedding, which I thought was funny. I don't know if that's <laughs> totally going to work. Yeah, the resol- uh, we need to get to a much, much greater resolution quality than what's yes. commercially available. And the government also has to approve that we're allowed to take pictures of Earth at that resolution quality. So yes. that, that might be a little ways away, but it's certainly not an Could impossible happen. thought. It could happen. I don't know if you yeah. want to be looking at everyone's, you know, top of their heads, you know, and maybe there's yeah. another angle there. But anyways, it was, it was, it's interesting. So there's a lot going on. You know, we've similarly, there's a ton of experimentation happening in launch systems and launch companies. So I guess the question I would just ask in a super wide open way is, what do, what do you see that's really exciting? And that can be industries, that can be particular companies. And what do you think doesn't get enough tension, attention that we should be talking about more or that people maybe aren't noticing that's kind of beneath the surface? I think this kind of dives into your second part, which is a little bit under the radar. But I think um, companies currently that are building reusable second stages, right? So when you think of a rocket, right, in traditional rockets, right, you have two stages where the first stage, often the larger part of the rocket, uh, helps accelerate the rocket to the upper parts of the atmosphere. So in the case of Falcon 9, about around 75, 80 kilometers, in which case the first stage jettisons off and then returns back to Earth, right? So we've, except then the second stage goes off, reaches orbital velocity, sends the payload into its proper orbit, but then the second stage kind of either continues to float into the atmosphere, right, pretty much, or not the atmosphere, the uh, just into orbital debris, right? And the first stage comes back and lands. Like we figured out that first stage part, but the second stage, um, and that's where that's the sort of vacuum optimized engine part of the two stages, getting that back down is 
something we haven't done yet. Now, Starship is going to try to attempt to do that. That's the whole plan behind it. So, and, and I suspect it will work. But even for all the smaller launch vehicles and, and, and sort of the medium lift launch vehicles, that isn't something that's happened. And it's very crucial to lowering the cost of space even further. Um, and, you know, I think one of the big issues there is like heat shielding and, you know, the fact that you are traveling much, much faster up in um, when you're trying to get to orbit versus what, where the first stage is traveling. I think it's something like, I want to say like five to 7,000 kilometers per hour versus like 18,000 or something. I don't know the exact number, but like the point is like you're coming back down to Earth at a much, much faster velocity. So heat shielding is particularly important. There's also a lot of other kind of underlying you know issues that there there are a few different companies that are looking to solve that I won't name but it's really easy to google and and see who they who they are i think the other breakthrough is really just what we've been talking about starship we don't need to belabor the point but i really do think that that's going to be a breakthrough in the industry and the the pace at which they're iterating and they're retiring technical risk is really just breathtaking and i would highly highly recommend anyone that even has a remote interest in the industry to actually look at those tests because they're so cool and they're really inspiring in terms of an industry or, or, or vertical or just a part of the economy that I don't think gets enough attention, I think is really like the space station side of things. So uh, I don't know how many people know this outside of the, inter- um, of the industry, but the International Space Station is going to be retired. I think by like 2031 or two is like the date because it's, you know, it's old and it's, and it's you know, it's, you know, has many, many issues. And you know, if you actually look over the last like couple of years, they've had some pretty significant issues as it relates to like their propulsion and, you know, just staying in orbit and just, you know, just, I mean, it's old, it's a, it's an old system, but NASA has basically said that they're going to deorbit the ISS and drop it into the Pacific ocean, right? That's going to be the end of its useful life. So uh, there are a number of commercial space station uh, businesses that are trying to build, you know, a future ISS and uh, we need it to be quite frank, because without the ISS, we don't have any orbital outpost or station that we can send um, astronauts to. And Congress has actually a directive where they want humans in low Earth orbit for many, many years. And, you know, we don't, you know, without the ISS, we actually don't have anything else. So the government now is actually relying on the private sector. Um, Meanwhile, China, by the end of this year, is going to just, you know, bringing in the geopolitical side of things like China, by the end of this year, is going to have its own orbiting uh, space station um, called Tiangong, right? And then Russia has their own plans. And um, I think it would be a huge disappointment in, I think, our you know industry, right? If we don't have something like that when the ISS is ready to retire. But the good news is there are many companies that are trying to do this, some that are farther along than others. But I have a lot of confidence that we're going to have a successor and it's going to be a lot, a lot cooler. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask one more question, which is around Starlink. And, and the, you know, so this was kind of inspired by one of the um, crazy ideas that I heard around why Elon Musk might be interested in acquiring Twitter is that, you know, if you think about the way the internet works today, it all basically goes through subsea cable, cables. And so it's very geographically bound. And basically, if you were a company, it's very easy to control the data that's coming in and the data that's going out. You know, with satellites that are now orbiting the Earth, you potentially have the ability that you're going from receiver in the U.S. to receiver on the other side of the world, and you're, and then all of the data is basically propagating kind of outside of geographic uh, boundaries to this other, you know, substation. And so one of the ideas that I heard was just it could potentially usher in a more democratic or open internet. Any thoughts on that, or any thoughts on the implications of what something like Starlink at scale means? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I think Starlink at scale, and you're 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 talking about internet connectivity from anywhere, literally anywhere in the world, right? I mean, ultimately, um, that in itself is exciting. Um, I think that there are still question marks, if I'm being honest, on the economics of Starlink, and it's it's actually a huge model yet to solve because Elon is relying on it on the free cash flow that he assumes that he'll generate from Starlink to be able to fund um, a lot of his other projects. The obvious reasons of why internet connectivity globally is so important is that there's still parts of this world where we don't, where there's no broadband connectivity. And it's a huge issue in terms of you know, country development, in terms of education, in terms of just general progress, right? So Starlink can definitely, especially if they can get, get it cheap enough, um, it can be, it, it'll be massive for all those reasons. Um, of course, we also know that you know, in, in Ukraine currently, Um, they are using Starlink. So you can already see the benefits of what it can do in sort of in disaster scenarios. Um, And Starlink is used in situations like that all the time. Now, some 
thankfully, most of that is not always in war torn areas, but also, you know, when it comes to, you know, like, you know, natural disasters or like where, you know, when you, when you don't have cell towers and you don't have the capability to connect, um, you know, satellite broadband can definitely, you know, achieve that goal. So I don't know, hopefully that answers your question, but yeah. obviously it, it, yeah. it can turn no, into I mean, a lot of different things. No, no, no. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting to think about the economic side of it. And obviously it's not just Starlink, it's Amazon's working on their own, you know, constellation one web. There's a whole host, like every area in space, there's many, many, many people chasing the same grand idea. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I want to transition and talk about payload space. And and where I wanted to start first is I think I want to start with the the brand voice. You know, you talked about being the morning brew for the for the space industry and uh you know, you talked about bringing Ryan Duffy in I think as a founding editor of that. For someone who is unfamiliar with what a founding editor does and what it means to try to have a media product where you, what you're really doing if I'm understanding it correctly is building a moat and a brand in a lot of ways around voice and, and how you show up and how you analyze. Talk about that a little bit and how you guys approach that problem and how you developed your voice or, or landed on, yes, this is it. No, this isn't it. <laughs> yeah, I think it was uh, the voice issue. The voice was fairly, uh, actually a fairly easy decision in what we wanted. You know, if you think about traditional media in space, it's actually very boring. It's very technical. There's not a lot of like, you know, key, you, you don't know what you need, what insights you should be gleaning from it. And, you know, it just, it's, it's just sort of, I mean, I hate to say it this way, but it can be, it can be boring sometimes. Right. And space is definitely not boring. Right. Like you, even the most seemingly boring topics are actually very interesting when you actually figure out what the implication of that technology is for society and what is happening in the industry. Right. So for us, we, we wanted to build um, a product that it felt like it was speaking to you, right? It felt like that. Okay, like I know that sounds a little cheesy, but right, um, we we want we want payload to become a habit for people, right? Every single morning, especially in, if you're in the industry, right? And that's who are you know really catering to right now. If you're in the industry and you want to know what's happening, you have to read us every single morning. And how do we make it more fun? We want to, you know, I mean, we want to add pop culture to it. We want to add it. We want to make it relevant. We want people to, 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 you know, to, to laugh, right? <laughs> like we want to throw in jokes, like, you know, Ryan threw in like a, you know, joke the other day from like Mean Girls, right? You know, I think like <laughs> that pop culture reference, which I mean, you know, like you, you'll definitely like, not everyone will get it, but those that do, it's going to be really resonating for them. And they're going to really like, really enjoy that. And for us, the other side of it is like, space is becoming a lot younger, right? That's just the nature of what's happening. Like there's a lot more people who are interested in what's happening in space who are, you know, engineers in other industries, software engineers, mechanical engineers, who are like, hey, like I could work in this really cool new industry, right? So like, we also want to figure out, we also wanted to kind of cater to a, a younger generation that wanted, you know, that they want bite size, they want quick, you know, smart, as Axios would say, it's smart brevity and insights, right? And that's how we're kind of thinking about how we tell the story of, of what's happening. Yeah. Super interesting. I, I want to talk a little bit about, um, and you don't, I don't want you to give away anything because before we were recording, we're talk, you know, talking a little bit about just where you're at now as a company, some of the things you're thinking about. Um, but one of the questions I want to ask is again, from somebody who I don't have a ton of familiarity with what it is like to launch a media brand, to pick a specific vertical or form factor, and then think about how you expand out from there. But I would assume that, you know, it's it's very much an exercise of the, the ambition at the end of the day is very large and you need to choose exactly where you're going to focus your resources early on. So what I wanted to ask was, how did you go about making the decision to focus on a newsletter? And maybe for those of us that aren't familiar, why is the newsletter a thing to, to focus on? And then how do you think about it at a really high level, expanding out from there. And I think, again, the reason I'm really interested is just I have no context for how to think about that. So I want you to try to decode maybe how you think about it at a high level and kind of share that. Yeah. So like to your point, right, we're a newsletter first product. Um, and, you know, we it, it really is it goes to and I don't actually know who said this quote, but it's an important quote. And that it's one we sort of live by, which is like the newsletter has become the new homepage. You know, we live in a world where most news is read on mobile. And there's been a huge proliferation of newsletters, especially with the success of companies like Axios that have, you know, um, there's, there's so many businesses that have built on the concept of, of, of emails and smart brevity. Um, and, you know, the way that 
consumers consume media um, and news has changed very significantly, right? And that's one of the things that we really wanted to tap on. The other side of the coin is really like, it kind of comes down to the revenue model, right? The way you generate revenue as a media business is generally through ads. And um, right now, there's a huge opportunity in advertising um, for media in general, I think, like just sort of new digital media, but even within space. What I will say really quickly and why we decided to do the newsletter um, format is one, because it's sort of our top of the funnel. It's free, right? And it's always going to be free, at least as the current product stands. And, you know, we just wanted to create something that just grow a huge audience, right? And it's a lot harder to grow an audience in the very beginning um, if you charge them for a product, right? So for us, it's like, let's build a huge audience. Let's make the newsletter at the top of the funnel. And then over time, we'll figure out other products that could be more monetizable for us. And we're launching a podcast actually next week. Um, we're thinking, you know, we're doing webinars, we're doing events, we're doing, um, we're going to do a paid research product down the road, but it's going to be different from the core newsletter, right? The core newsletter will always be free, but we're going to have a paid product um, down the line, right? And, 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 but ultimately, the newsletter really is the top of the funnel because it's just how people consume these days. No one really wants to click out. I mean, I don't know the last time, um, you know, you may have gone to like wallstreetjournal.com or New York Times or CNN or what have you, right? Most people now just read like their news, like on this, right? And that's just, you know, that's just how the industry has evolved, right? So that's why we decided to go the the road, go down the route that we did. Yeah, that makes sense. And and so talk a little bit about what that vision looks like. Like, what do you hope payload looks like in ten years time? Is it is it having a broadcast program? Is it going into other mediums, or is it just expanding out thoughtfully as you've talked about? Of you have a newsletter, then it's a podcast, then it's potentially paid research, and you're just kind of organically growing that surface area over time. I think the vision vision question, answer to that question is, you know, um, I would I would love Payload to be the most important voice in the industry. Like success for me would be if we became the largest and most respected media company in space um, that can help inform um, decisions for the most influential people in the industry. Whether you're in policy, whether you're in commercial space, whether you're an investor, um, you know, member of the C-suite or just starting an internship, right? Um, and I do believe that we have the right team to achieve that goal. But that really is the goal, right? The, the goal is like, how do we become the most important voice in the industry? Um, and if we have become the most important voice in the industry, then we've, we, I know we've built a really, really big business. And look, the media model is not, there's no special sauce on the media model. It's really just about execution, right? You build your audience and you sell ads. And you sorry, you generate content, build audience, sell ads. Like that's really the, 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 the flywheel. There's no, and the generate content piece of it can be in, in a lot of different forms. It can be, through um, voice, it can through it can be through you know print. It can well print is dead right now, but I mean it could be through like some forms of print. It could be um, could come back. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> who knows? Um, but uh, probably not though. Um, <laughs> but you know the generate content piece of it can come in a lot of different forms, and we're gonna you know obviously continue investing in content and making sure that we achieve ultimately try like look always look to that sort of north star of like becoming that important voice. But, you know, to me, like, that's really the overarching goal. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's much more of a goal of what, how you want to be seen in the position you want to have in the industry, which is being the most respected voice. And then from there, it doesn't matter. It, it'll be whatever makes sense, whatever's workable. <laughs> if we've achieved that goal, then I can guarantee you that we are, have become a huge company, right? Because the industry, it is at its inflection point, right? It's yeah. just starting. And it's going to be really exciting to see what happens. Like there's so much money flowing into the space. Companies are just now starting to understand the value of paid advertising and what that means for their brand. That's not something that was really often thought about in the space industry, but it is definitely part of the market that's going to grow. Um, the ad side of the market is really exciting and really interesting to see how it develops. And we're, we're seeing it firsthand, right? We're effectively creating this new market for at least for the newer commercial space companies. Um, that, you know, don't have marketing people that don't have, they don't have folks that like, you know, folk really focus on, you know, brand building. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges for the industry right now, if you ask me, like, what's the biggest friction point for the industry for the next one to two years, it's actually going to be hiring. There are so many companies that have raised a lot of money. And the first thing that you do when you raise a lot of money is you go out and hire. And everyone is hiring off of that same pool. So it's become a very, very top and very competitive market, job market, right? I mean, that's, that's the case kind of in a lot of industries, but specifically in space, I'm seeing it even more um, exacerbated. So, um, 
you know, there, there is a real value in getting your name out there and getting your brand out there because there's a lot of great companies. And oftentimes the reason why companies die is because they're not able to tell their story and people don't understand it. Right. So like, anyway, this is all to say that we're very, all very excited. (laughs) Yeah. Well, no, and it's interesting to hear, you know, just you talk a little bit about that it, one of the major forms that ads will be used is just basically to share the story of what you're building as a space company to try to one, get candidates to try to build your notoriety because it's also, you know, as being a subscriber of Axios for a long time, it's amazing. There are very few direct to consumer ads that you're going to find in Axios. It's very much a like brand building kind of exercise that people are doing through ads, which is fascinating. Well, I'll tell you, like, you know, the science side of space has always captured a massive global audience, right? Um, e- even on the brand side, think of like, you know, the Omega Speedmaster, right? The, the Moonwatch, right? And the Apollo missions and, and you know, a number of brands have helped fund uh, research and science on the ISS. And actually, not a lot of people know this, but if you actually look at NASA's social media presence, NASA has something like, I don't know, something like 50 or 60 million um, Twitter followers. I know these numbers because we actually were, we've looked at this before. Um, NASA has something like 50 or 60 million Twitter followers, like, and the NFL has like 30 million, right? And the NBA has 37 million. Like on the Instagram side, um, NASA has something like 75 or 80 million Instagram followers, right? That's as, pretty much as much as like a Dua Lipa or a Gigi Hadid. So like a lot of people, a lot of people don't even like think about that. And then also like if you remember, do you remember back in October? And it was like a 2012, I think fall of 2012, when Felix, Felix Baumgartner jumped off the the uh, the yes. balloon from the yeah. stratosphere and it was like the Red stratosphere Bull. jump, the largest. Yep. Yeah, it was Red Bull. And there are a lot of um, there are a lot of uh, brand sort of like consultants that ended up doing an analysis on that and basically came to the conclusion that that generated billions of dollars of brand value for Red Bull. Now that is a spectacle, and I'm not saying that that's what space is evolving to, but it's more to say that space can command. A really, really large audience, right? So you have you have sort of the industry side of things where like, you know, the industry needs to know um, about each other, sort of that's one advertising angle and kind of marketing angle. And then if there's, there's, of course, the how do you use the, the, the visionary side of space, the sort of the romantic side of space to help elevate your brand, right? And this is not to say that we're focused in on that side of it. But that is something that we're just paying attention to and just seeing how it evolves. Yeah. No, it feels like another way to talk about it is space is becoming a bigger and bigger part of popular, cool culture. It's no longer just for nerds, <laughs> which I feel like back in the day, if you had a, you know, if, you, if it was 20 years ago and you had a NASA t-shirt on, you were definitely a nerd or you just wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> well, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> I want to ask two closing questions. And one is, you know, you talked about that you've been building payload for almost two years now. You're building the, you know, from my experience, from my purview, the first and the best media brand dedicated to space, uh, which is, I think been, it's been fascinating and a ton of fun to watch. When you look back at that journey so far, what are one or two of the biggest lessons you learned? And what is, you know, you talked about that moment where you started seeing CEOs in the industry signing up as being really exciting. What other moments ha- have just, be, I don't know, fed you guys as you've been building payload from day one? I would say the the thing that still keeps us going is just, you know, we, we get a tremendous amount of, I mean, just reader feedback. I mean, it's really awesome to see like when a reader says, hey, you really helped shape my view on the industry or, Hey, you really convinced me that this is some face. I really, you know, this is where I want to work or, Hey, it's so cool. You know, uh, I had no idea there was so much, you know, happening in this industry. Thank you for like illuminating it for me. Like that to us is like the easiest way for us to just say to ourselves, Hey, look for what it's worth at the end of the day, like we are providing a tremendous amount of value to people and it's awesome. Right. That's that, that really helps keep, keep us going. And we just, we really didn't expect the extent of how much feedback we get. We have a Slack channel that's just called feedback and it's like constantly pinging throughout the day. So it's always nice to see that and it does like help us. It, it, it's a tremendous motivator. That's so cool. Any one or two lessons you feel like you've learned over the last 18 months that are generalizable or that you'd pass on to other founders that are maybe tackling a similar problem? Yes. Embrace boring Sometimes there are parts of building a business that are just not exciting and they're not sexy and they're just like, you just don't want to do it. But like, it's okay. You know, not every single part of company building is like, you know, oh, you just won this great contract or you got, you know, you just closed this big customer and like, let's celebrate. Most of it is actually not that. Most of it is just, you know, dealing with like 
I don't know, HR stuff. Like we're actually dealing with this like administrative issue now that we have on the HR side. And we're just like, we like didn't register something with one state. And it's just like, like, ugh, am I really going to spend half my day on this? But like, you know what? That's just part of it, right? And you just have to be okay with it and you just need to do it and you need to move on, right? So embrace the boredom is what I would say. No, that's a very good advice. Okay, last question. We're at an inflection point. Clearly part of that is it seems like future generations, space will have a much, much bigger place in their life. Whether it's just news that's happening, whether it's the industries that they work on, whether it's you know having their own satellite up in space. Um, w- w- try to paint a little bit of a picture of what you hope space looks like 20 or 30 years from now. And what do you hope that it looks and feels like for the next generation? Um, I think um, this is my bold prediction. I'm going to say 30 years, not 20 years. I'm going to say in 30 years, if you want to go to the moon, you will be able to go to the moon. It might cost a lot, but I think you will be able to go to the moon. I do think it will cost a lot, but I actually don't think it's going to be like prohibitively expensive that only like the, you know, the ultra wealthy can go. I think it will be one of those um, expenses that it's going to be very expensive, but like ultimately it's not going to, it's going to be like, you can chalk it up to a once in a lifetime experience at the cost of, I don't know, like, I don't know, the cost of a car, right? Like something like that, which I know is crazy to say, by the way. And a lot of people might hear me answer this and say, like, just laugh and say, okay, well, that's obviously not happening. I think it's important to be humble about where this industry is going because I don't think anyone predicted 10 or 20 years ago that we'd be here. So I really don't know if in 10 or 20 years ago, we're just going to have like the cost structure of everything is going to change dramatically. It's going to get so, you know, it's going to get so much safer. There's going to be a, you know, entrepreneur that changes things even, even, even more than Elon has. Like, yes, a lot of people say that Elon is sort of like a generational once in a lifetime sort of like entrepreneur, but he has really paved the way for a lot of future entrepreneurs to like really turn sort of the rules upside down. And um, I think that, you know, in 30 years, I think we'll be able to go to the moon. I hope I'm right. And, you know, it doesn't look like that right now. I think if you like just run the numbers, <laughs> my statement probably doesn't make much sense, but I'm also just banking on the fact that there's a lot of innovation that we just sometimes just can't predict. Yeah. You're banking on that. The power law is going to, going to play out and things like starship that can in, with, with, you know, change via an order of magnitude, the cost structure will work, which, which clearly we're headed in that direction. Thank you so much for the time, Mo, uh, from, you know, for the space nerd inside me, the kid that went to space camp early on, it was super cool to see it, to chat with you and talk through all this. If you're Daniel, listening or having me, yes. If you're listening or watching, you can sign up for payload spaces, daily newsletter, which I highly recommend at payloadspace.com, And you can also follow them on Twitter at payload space. Also, Mo, I really like your Twitter account. So I'm going to share it, which is just, it's Mo Islam um, on Twitter. Thank you so much for the time. <laughs> I appreciate that, Daniel. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 110. That's 110. At outlieracademy.com, you can find all of our other founder interviews profiling incredible companies like 8Sleep, Common Stock, Varda Space Industries, Superhuman, Primal Kitchen, and 1-800-GOT-CHUNK, among many, many others. In every interview, we deconstruct the ideas, frameworks, and strategies they use to build these incredible companies. You can now also find videos of all of our interviews on YouTube at youtube.com slash outlier academy. On our channel, you'll find all of our full-length interviews as well as our favorite short clips from every episode, including this one. So make sure to subscribe. We post new videos and clips every single week. And if you haven't already, follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn under the handle Outlier Academy. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you right here with a brand new episode next Wednesday.